Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottertune. Learn how to automatically optimise your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottertune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. All right, let's get started. Uh, it's another talk today in our Vaccination Database Seminar series here at Carnegie Mellon. Today, we're excited to have uh, Lynn Ma. Lynn is a PhD candidate in my group at CMU, uh, and his focus has been on the self-driving database systems. Um, one of the big controversies about Lynn is that he was voted the most congenial PhD student in the Carnegie Mellon Database Group in 2017, 2018, but not in 2020, but not 2019. So, uh, as always, as Lynn gives the talk, if you have any questions, please uh, in, uh, unmute yourself. Uh, say who you are and where you're coming from, and feel free to interrupt at any time. You want this to be a conversation. So with, with that, Lynn, the floor is yours. Go for it. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Uh, I want to say that uh, I was not voted for the most congenial PhD student in 2019 only because um, I was TAU for Andy's class. That's his fault. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyway, um, yeah, like Andy said, uh, thanks for the uh, nice introduction. Uh, I'm being um, from this uh, very group, kind of human database group. I'm pretty happy to be here today uh, talking about our system, right? Uh, we call it a self-driving database system uh, named a noise page. All right, so I want to first uh, mention uh, or discuss a little bit about uh, why we are doing this. So basically, database system have already become an essential piece for many of the uh, modern data-driven applications, right? However, they are also becoming uh, more and more complex and very difficult to manage. So uh, according to uh, these uh, report, reports, uh, personnel is already estimated to be almost 50% of the total ownership cost of a database system. And then more than 70% of the database administrators, or we call DBAs, actually think that uh, performance tuning occupies most of their time. And this process, this database administration process, is not only laborious and costly, but also is pretty difficult to scale. So according to the same set of reports, more than 70% of the DBAs are also managing an increasing number of databases over the year. And then, um, yeah, according to these uh, same reports. And then uh, for large corporations or uh, cloud vendors, they actually even need to uh, host thousands or even millions of databases at the same time. So we think that this uh, manual database administration process has really becoming a bigger and bigger impediment uh, for modern data-driven applications. Right. So uh, what are the existing solutions uh, for this problem? Well, uh, there are many existing uh, tuning tools developed by uh, vendors and researchers over the years. <laughs> but the problem is that most of these tools still require extensive human guidance. So in a typical scenario to apply these tools, a DBA will first need to prepare a sample workload of the application and then prepare uh, some spare hardware and then fork a copy of the system. And then they will run those tuning tools to get a set of change recommendations. Then the DBA uh, needs to uh, examine these uh, change recommendations, pick the best one using their domain knowledge, and then decide when to apply those change, and finally apply those changes manually. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, they, they actually have to carefully do this to apply those changes when the workload volume is low, such as 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. in the morning, which is not really a pleasant task. And, and furthermore, most of these uh, existing tuning tools only focus on a single aspect of the database at a time, uh, such as indexing, uh, partitioning, or knob tuning. So essentially, what this means is that the DBA needs to repeat this onerous tuning process over and over again uh, for each of these aspects of the database. Now, well, recently, there's actually a push from cloud vendors to provide more automated cloud database services. So I think that the two more prominent examples of this are the uh, Oracle Autonomous Database, as well as the uh, uh, Azure Automatic Index Management for the uh, Microsoft Azure CQ. And then a majority of these uh, services will actually just run their tuning tools, just like what I uh, discussed, in, just in a loop leveraging their uh, cloud infrastructure. So the issue is that this actually still requires pretty expensive exploratory tests uh, with those recommendations. So the vendors will first need to fork a database and then forward some work with the traffic to that fork and then uh, apply and test all the different recommendations uh, from the tools to see which change is best or if any change is good. 
And also, uh, most of these kind of services would still focus on a single aspect of the database at a time without a holistic view of the organization. And lastly, uh, most of these uh, services are reactionary to the shifts in the workload patterns, which means that uh, they only address the database administration problem after the problems occur. So all of this motivate our exploration on a new generation of self-driving database management systems. So uh, we define a self-driving database as a database that can configure, tune, and optimize all system aspects without any human intervention. So uh, these aspects would include, uh, for example, physical design, uh, such as building indexes, or data placement, uh, such as assigning hot or cold storage, and then CQ tuning, knob tuning, or even uh, scaling resources up and down. Uh, however, uh, there are a few aspects of the database uh, that we think just fundamentally require human judgment, uh, such as security or access list control. So we think a self-driven database can't really automate those aspects. Uh, and then we think there are a few reasons that make it possible to build a self-driven database right now or today instead of 20 or 30 years ago. So the first is that uh, in this data-driven area, not only the database system can store more data, but also it can collect more metrics and more stats about the system itself so that we can extract knowledge and patterns out of those data to help the system control itself. And second is that with the improvements in hardware technologies, not only the database stores more data for the user, but also it can process data much faster and then retrieve information and also perform the calculation for the self-driving operation faster. And lastly, uh, the recent advances in AI or artificial intelligence and machine learning also provides more convenient tools and better algorithms to help us to achieve a such self-driving goal. Okay. So now let me introduce at high level uh, the self-driving architecture that we are developing. Uh, but, but before I get into the details of self-driving databases, I actually want to make an analogy uh, to self-driving cars. So I should clarify that I'm just explaining, explaining a very simplified view of self-driving cars. And in actuality, self-driving cars are much more complex, uh, but I think this would be a good analogy for the understanding purposes here. So first, a self-driving car would need a perception component that uses its uh, cameras and radars to observe other vehicles and pedestrians on the road and then uh, predict where they are moving to. And the second, a self-driving car has models about the effects of its potential actions. Uh, for example, if you turn the steering wheel by 20 degrees, well, the car needs to know what will happen, right? And then for cars, uh, usually these um, physical or mechanical models are uh, directly embedded when the car is built. However, it's a little bit different uh, for self-driving databases, which I'll explain later. And lastly, uh, there will be a planning component uh, that uses the road perception as well as the uh, action model estimations to plan a sequence of actions to get to where the car wants to go. Okay. Then our design of a self-driving database actually shares analogies uh, to the self-driving car architecture I just discussed. So uh, our architecture first contains a workload forecasting component that can observe and predict what the workload the database is going to execute in the future. So I think it is necessary essentially just because you need to know what you are optimizing for and then optimize for it. And second, there's a behavior modeling component that builds behavior models to predict the cost and benefit of different self-driving actions. Uh, for example, building an index or building an index or change certain knobs, what would be the effect of those things? Right. And lastly, an action planning component plans uh, actions to optimize the system performance given the forecasted database workload as well as the estimated action behavior. So in this talk, I will first briefly discuss our, one of our previous works on a workload forecasting framework for self-driving databases. And then I will spend most of my time on a framework that uh, we just developed to build database behavior models. And next, I will introduce at a very high level our ongoing work on the last planning component, if we have time to do that. Uh, lastly, I will mention uh, how we are integrating all these uh, components into the new self-driven database uh, we are, that we are building, which is called Noise Page. So let me start with the first component, workload forecasting. So we contend that this is the first step towards building a self-driven database, uh, because it is, it, is, it is very important to know what the workload database is going to execute in the short or near future, oh, sorry, in the short or longer future. 
So this is important because uh, there are certain actions that, that self driving database uh, needs to apply, such as uh, building indexes, uh, partitioning the data, or scaling the resources up and down that may take a long time to finish, right? For example, if you want to build an index with a, on a table with 10 billion rows, well, to finish that action may take hours. So it might be too late that you only apply these expensive actions after you observe that the workload already requires them. And furthermore, you may also want to apply these uh, actions when the workload volume is low to avoid resource contention. So now we define the workload forecasting problem for self-driven database as the ability to predict uh, when, how many, and what queries will arrive to a database at a given future time point. So beyond this, there are also two important concepts. The first is how long into the future that we are predicting. For example, this could be one hour or one hour week. Uh, that's what we call a prediction horizon. Right? And the second is what is the granularity for such prediction? Uh, for example, this could be a per minute level or per hour level. That's what we call a prediction interval. So a good workload forecasting framework of a self-driving database would actually uh, first need to achieve good uh, prediction accuracy for different combinations of prediction horizons and intervals. And then it also needs to uh, capture the major database workload patterns, which I will give some examples. So, and lastly, it should also achieve a good balance uh, between cost and accuracy. Uh, but there are a few challenges here. So the first is that in order to apply a self-driving database in production, the workload forecast team would need to capture and predict the workload patterns online and also handles the changes in the workload patterns dynamically. And second is that modern database workloads can actually have a high volume. So for the purpose of this project, we collected the traces for three medium-sized real-world database workloads, and all of them execute at least millions of queries per day. And next, there can also be uh, different patterns in data, different database workloads. For example, in the first workload trace we collected, uh, which is from a, a Pittsburgh a local bus tracking service, there is a diurnal workload pattern that follows the human living cycle. Essentially, there are more queries arrive during the daytime and on weekdays, comparing to uh, weekends or the nighttime. And then in the second trace, which is from the uh, CMU application and admission website, there's a different growth and spike pattern with a peak around the admission deadline. So not only different database applications may have a different workload patterns, but also different subsets of queries within a single database workload may also have different patterns simultaneously. So a good workload forecasting framework needs to capture all of these. So to address those challenges, we developed a framework called a Peribot 5000 to build the workload forecasting component for self-driving databases. So at a high level, it works this way. When uh, the application sends the SQL queries to the database, the database forwards these queries uh, to QueryBot 5000. And these are historical queries that arrive in large volume. And then these queries will go through the three steps of QueryBot 5000, uh, namely pre-processing, uh, clustering, and forecasting. And then I will briefly talk about uh, them very soon. And after all these steps, QueryBot 5000 generates compact prediction for the future CQ workloads used by the later self-driving components. So first, as I mentioned before, there can be millions of queries arrived to a database system per day, and even just for medium-sized applications. So it would be too costly to capture the patterns for all of these queries, and also build forecasting models for each single one of those queries. And there has to be some compression. So the first compression we did is just to extract the constant parameters out of those queries, and then we only record the patterns and build forecasting models at this uh, query template level. And in database terminology, essentially we just convert those queries to uh, prepare segments. And of course, the distribution of these uh, parameters would matter. So we keep a certain parameter samples for each query template using a reserver sampling. And then additionally, we also group semantically equivalent queries to the same query template. So this simple step already allows us to reduce the millions of queries that we need to forecast per day to thousands of query templates. So uh, this is good, but then even with that step, it's still too costly to build forecasting models for thousands of query templates, especially if you want to use some advanced machine learning techniques such as neural networks. So uh, next, 
we have a cluster instead uh, that would further group a similar query templates together. So uh, for clustering, uh, probably the most important question to ask is just uh, what is the similarity metric that you are going to use to group a similar query templates together? So there are a few options. The first is what we call a physical features, which are the runtime metrics that the system can record after the query is executed. For example, this could be a uh, tuple thread, tuple road, uh, and, and the query latency. However, the problem is that if a self-driving database uh, applies certain actions, such as building an index, then those physical features, right, such as number of tuples read, would actually change. And then in that case, the clustering results would be invalid, and we need to redo the clustering and then build the forecasting models all over again. So this is not really uh, suitable for our purposes here. Then another option is what we call the logical feature which are the information you can extract from the query logical composition. So in other words, uh, this is the, the, the abstract, uh, the query abstract syntax tree. For example, uh, what would be the type of the query, what would be the columns referenced, or the number of joins, et cetera. Uh, so uh, this feature is certainly independent of the self-driving actions. However, in our experiments, we just found that there's not enough information in those kind of logical features to generate good clustering results. In the other words, the clustering quality is not very good, and we couldn't really select a good, great self-driving actions based on this kind of query clusters. So it's not really uh, suitable either. So now what we eventually end up using is what we call the arrival rate feature. So our, our, our observation is that if we are generating models to predict the query arrival rate in the future, but then why not we just directly group query templates based on their arrival rate pattern and then we just need only to need to build one model for each arrival rate pattern, right? So the reason we can do this is that for many database applications, queries are actually generated in batches using tools like ORMs or store procedures. So many subsets of queries may actually arrive at the database system at a similar time. Thus, they may just have a similar arrival rate feature. So to illustrate this, uh, assuming that uh, this is the arrival rate history of a single query template, what we are going to do is just to sample a few arrival rate values at a few timestamps and then to form the arrival rate feature and then do clustering based on that. So uh, we found in our evaluation that this is actually a pretty effective uh, clustering approach. And in fact, if we only consider the largest five clusters based on such uh, arrival rate uh, feature clustering, then that five clusters already covers more than 95% of the total workload or volume for all of our three uh, real world workloads. And essentially we only need to build forecasting models for these uh, largest clusters that can cover the majority of the workload, which significantly reduces uh, our forecasting overhead. Right. And then lastly, uh, to build the forecasting models uh, for each of these uh, query template cluster, uh, we investigated a number of uh, popular time series forecasting methods with various properties, uh, such as whether they are linear, whether they retain memory, or whether they use a kernel methods, et cetera. Uh, in summary, what we eventually found is that there's no single method performs best in all scenarios to capture all of those uh, different worker patterns. Uh, so in machine learning, one approach to address this is called ensemble, where we just uh, combine multiple models together with different properties uh, to acquire a better predictive power. And in, th in this case, we found that the combination of linear regression, a recurrent neural network, and a kernel regression give us the best empirical accuracy. And, and there are also uh, some other tricks that we apply here to improve the uh, predicting accuracy, such as normalizing the input features or called whitening uh, and uh, predicting the arrival rates of uh, different clusters together. So uh, the model can use uh, the arrival rate patterns of uh, different uh, clusters uh, altogether to uh, predict the future for the arrival rates. All right. Uh, now I just want to show you uh, one example of our uh, forecasting results. So which is uh, to predict the query arrival rates for the bus tracking application that I mentioned earlier. So I want to uh, clarify that for the demonstration purpose, I'm only showing you the forecast of the total workloads in the future, but our framework is actually predicting uh, the future arrival rates for each individual query template used by the later, uh, later self-driving components. So here I'm showing you the results uh, for two different prediction horizons. On the top is to predict the workload one hour from now, and then on the bottom is to predict the workload uh, one week from now. Uh, so from these results, we can first tell that uh, predicting the workload one hour from now is certainly easier than predicting the workload one week from now. 
So this is good for self-driving database because the system does need to prioritize its optimizations to the workloads in the near future. And then for the workloads far ahead of time, there's always the opportunity to optimize them later, right? And then second, no matter for the one hour horizon or for the one week horizon, we can see that our forecasting framework both generates reasonably accurate predictions. So actually now, before I get to uh, the next component, uh, I'm wondering, is there any uh, questions from the audience? I, I'd rather people interrupt and ask clarification questions, et cetera, instead of uh, being confused about something and left confused uh, for, half, for half an hour. I'm wondering, is there any questions? I think you're good, Len, keep going. <laughs> Just keep, go, keep going. Now, uh, if you remember the uh, self-driving architecture that I mentioned earlier, I just described the, our framework to build the first workload forecasting component. Right? And we think this uh, forecasting ability provides the premises for the later modeling and planning components to complete the self-driving operation. And the next, I'm just going to talk about uh, a work that we recently did to build the behavior models for self-driving databases. So uh, the task of behavior modeling is to generate behavior models that can predict the cost and benefit uh, for different self-driving actions. So to be slightly more specific, the input of these models are the forecasted workload in the future, as well as some candidate actions that a self-driving database may apply. And then the outputs are the cost, best, cost and, and benefit estimations for that action on the specific workload. And this could include uh, how long this action takes, uh, how these actions may help improve certain query latency, as well as the changes in resource consumptions, et cetera. Uh, so to uh, further motivate the necess necessity of such uh, behavior models, uh, here I'm showing you an example experiment where we remove an important uh, secondary index from the TPCC workload, and then we create this index back as a self-driving action with two different choices of, of actions that use a different number of create index threads. So we, we will start the workload with no secondary index. And as you can see, uh, at this stage, the query latency is relatively high. And then we apply such create index action at around 50 seconds. And we can see that right after the action start, the queries actually become slower because the index creation is competing resources with regular database queries. And then uh, using eight create index threads, will cause the queries to be slower than using a full create index threads because more resource consumption. Right? Uh, but then the index creation finishes much faster with eight threads. So the queries become faster earlier. And we think uh, this ability to accurately predict the effects of these uh, self-driving actions is really the foundation for a robust and effective control of all self-driving databases. Uh, but, but then there are quite some challenges. So the first is that the database system is actually a pretty complex software. And if we want, for example, using a single monolithic machine learning model to capture all aspects of the system, including all types of workloads, as well as all kinds of possible actions, the model can be really high dimensional and with easily hundreds of dimensions, if not more, right? And this would actually subsequently require lots of training data to train such a model and also pretty difficult to debug. And secondly, uh, in the modern uh, multi-core environments, actions and queries may actually run concurrently in a single system, right? So the models would also need to capture all kinds of interference uh, between the concurrent operations, which can further increase the number of possible inputs to the models exponentially. And the next, uh, while many of the previous, previous works on database modeling focus on the modeling algorithms, there's actually a lack of a principled framework to generate the appropriate and sufficient training data to train these models. Especially for certain database operations, it can be very expensive to collect the training data. As I mentioned earlier, for example, if you want to know how much time to create an index on a table with 10 billion rows, well, getting that single label for that single action may already take hours, right? very expensive. And lastly, uh, for the practical application of a self-driving databases, uh, these models, models should also have a good interpretability, a debuggability, and adaptivity. So to address uh, these challenges, we present an offline framework that generates behavior models 
for self-joint analysis. Uh, we call it a model bot two or MB2 in variation. So let me give, give an overview of the entire MB2 process. So MB2 first uses a set of specialized runners to fully exercise a different system components of a database system. And then these runners would use the same lightweight metric system to collect the training data and then send to a programmatic training framework that use data to generate uh, two types of uh, behavior models to the system, and namely one, one uh, set of operating unit models and then another uh, separate interference model. And now I'm going into the details of, those, of this uh, framework. So the core idea of MB2 is to decompose the complex database functionality into a small and independent operating units, or we call OUs, uh, to model separately. So the main benefit of this approach is that each model is low dimensional, does not require a huge amount of training data to train, and also are friendly to interpret and, deep to, and debug. And in this case, it's also easier to adapt these models under a software update. Uh, for example, if we change a few uh, specific aspects of the database system, then we only need to change the models for those uh, specific uh, components, and we don't need to uh, change all the models. So to give you an example, <laughs> we decompose our uh, noise page system to around 20 operating units or OUs, including uh, building hash table or creating index. And, and I want to note that if you want to apply MB2 to other systems, uh, then the developers of the system are actually responsible for decomposing the entire system into small tasks. And then the difficulty of which is dependent on uh, how modularized the system architecture is, as well as how familiar the developers are uh, with the system. And that's actually part of the reason why we are building a self driving database from the scratch so that we can have a, a clean design and also good understanding of the system. And then for each of these OU model, they would have a specific set of input features that represent how much work uh, a specific OU is going to perform. So these features can be uh, different among different OUs. And these features may also include the database knobs that may impact the corresponding OU's behavior. So for example, uh, the OU model for serializing the log records may contain the knob of serialization interval. But then all of these uh, OUs share the same set of output labels, which would include the uh, operating unit or OU completion time, and also different resource consumption metrics, such as uh, CPU, IO, and memory. And note that for one type of resource, there may actually be multiple fields in the output. For example, the CPU metrics may have a CPU time, a cache references, a cache misses, et cetera. And then uh, during the inference time, the self, or, or during the prediction time, the self joint database will just sums up the prediction of all the OUs to estimate the behavior of the entire system. So to be a little bit more specific here, we classify all the OUs in a database system into three high-level categories. And the first is what we call singular OUs, for which the OU model would just predict the behavior of a single OU invocation. For example, uh, what would be the uh, cost and the completion time would be the uh, memory consumption of building a hash table, right, for example. And then most of the OUs in our system belongs to this uh, category. And the second category is what we call a batching OUs, where the OU model actually predicts the behavior of several OU invocations together in a fixed time window. So this is mostly for the database maintenance tasks that it would perform periodically, such as uh, serializing the log records. So for, these, uh, for those kind of tasks, the amount of work to perform in each invocation is dependent on uh, how much work is left from the last invocation. So it's kind of difficult to predict the behavior for just one single invocation of that OU. And then uh, lastly, there's also a category of uh, contending OUs where uh, the internal synchronization mechanism of that operating unit uh, may affect the OU behavior. So uh, for those OUs, we would just include the contending information in their model input feature. For example, in this case, we would include the degree of parallelism for the OU of uh, creating an index in parallel because I mean, there could be internal synchronization algorithms, either uh, latch crabbing or some uh, weight on the compared swap to finish that would affect the OU's behavior if you created this index uh, in parallel. 
And again, to give a specific example here, uh, the build hash table OU model will have the number of rows, number of columns, column sizes, and estimated cardinality. And lastly, a related knob uh, that will impact the hash table creation in our system as the uh, input feature. Okay. And next, to collect the training data for these OUs, we use a set of specialized runners that we wrote ourselves that sufficiently exercise each OU through some CQ-based synthetic benchmarks. So, yes, please. How, uh, how fast, potentially? All right, uh, I'll keep going. So, sorry. I, there... I, I don't think that, that was a question. Okay. All right, you got it. Okay, so, so wait, wait. <laughs> then uh, let me uh, illustrate how this works. So essentially, uh, in our system, each OU is paired with an OU runner to enumerate uh, various possible inputs for that OU. So for example, in this case, the hash table OU runner would well, we will use a set of customer, customized workloads to exercise the hash table creation with a different number of rows, different types of columns, different kinds, et cetera, to get the labels for the hash table OU model. And then after all these runners, we would use a decentralized metric system uh, that leveraging a uh, thread local storage uh, to collect the features and labels uh, for these different OUs with low overhead. And then after that, a robust training framework would search over a wide range of uh, canonical and state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms to find the best uh, machine learning model for each OU. And we found in our experiment uh, that for the scale of our OU and the amount of training data we have, a gradient boosting machine typically performs the best. But the most important thing I want to uh, emphasize here is actually that uh, all these OUs are workload and dataset independent, which means that uh, they are generic models that we only train once offline, uh, and then the self joined database can apply them to any dataset or workload uh, during the production. So uh, another important thing I have mentioned earlier is that it could be uh, pretty expensive to collect labels for a certain database operations. Uh, for example, if you want to build a hash table or sort some uh, data or create an index, or that may process billions of rows, right? Could be very expensive to collect those labels. Then to address this, we leverage uh, one observation inspired by a previous work on query execution modeling, which is that uh, for many database operations, or we call OUs, they actually have known complexity based on the number of tuples processed. Okay, so what we, we do is that, what we can do is that if we fixed all the other input features about this number of tuples, and then we divide the output labels for these OUs by their corresponding complexity, complexity based on the tuple number, then we sort of get a per tuple output labels uh, that would actually converge to a, converge to a constant uh, when the number of tuples gets large enough, right? because that's their asymptotic complexity. So we, only, we would only need to collect labels for these OUs with the number of tuples up to such convergence point. And um, we found in, in our system that this convergence point is typically below 1 million rows uh, for all the OUs uh, in the our noise page system. And with this approach, it would take roughly 10 hours to collect the training data that would exercise all the OUs in our system, and which we think is an acceptable overhead uh, if you want to build a self-driving database. So now I'll just uh, present our uh, model generalization result in a single-threaded setting first. We haven't gotten the con concurrent setting yet, so right now it's single-threaded. So here we evaluate both OLAP and OLTP workloads. And then uh, again, we always use the same set of OU models generated offline by MB2 for this prediction. And for a baseline, we compare uh, MB2 against a state-of-the-art modeling technique on query execution called a QPNet. Uh, however, as mentioned earlier, QPNet, like uh, many uh, previous methods on uh, query execution modeling, do not have a training data generation framework. So uh, to simulate a production setup, we train QPNet on one of these uh, workloads and then evaluate on some other workloads. Okay. So here are the results. So uh, in those figures, the lower the bar is, uh, the smaller the errors are, and thus the predictions are better. So from this, you can see that if we evaluate the prediction of the two methods on the workload that QPNet are trained with, 
then QPNet would actually perform similar or better than MP2 because that's the workload that QPNet is trained on. And also QPNet has some uh, specialized model structure that can capture the workload pattern. Uh, but then on the workloads that QPNet uh, does not train with, MP2 actually achieves significantly better prediction. And then this is just due to MB2's decomposed framework that can generate sufficient training data for each of these uh, small OUs to build accurate models, build accurate models, as well as our output normalization technique that allows MB2 to generalize to data set that are magnitudes larger than the, what's in the training data. Uh, but then next, let's look at how MB2 uh, performs so far in an end-to-end -end set setup where there's, there's some concurrency, right? So in this case, we execute the system with a certain uh, canonical workloads while applying some self-driving actions. And I will save the specific workload and action details for the later. But the thing I want to emphasize here is that the database system in reality often execute in multi-core environments. And during this experiment, the database uh, on average uses 10 to 20 concurrent threads. And in this case, despite the agreed single thread prediction accuracy of MB2's models, uh, they actually always under predict without counting the resource computation among concurrent operations. And for example, the CPU computation. And especially uh, during this uh, time period, uh, when an expensive self-driving action is applied, the models would under predict significantly. So uh, to address this problem, we introduced another interference model that will capture this uh, concurrent impact. So what the interference model leverages is actually exactly the resource consumption levels predicted by the OU models. So to be specific, the input feature of these models are some summary statistics of the OU model outputs for some concurrent uh, OUs uh, run in the same interval, right? such as their sum, their mean, their variance, et cetera. And then the output labels are the adjustment ratios between the actual OU metrics and the OU model predictions uh, due to such interference. So uh, similar to the OU runners, we also devise a set of concurrent runners that exercise various kinds of interference among those operating units to generate the training data. So to uh, wrap everything up, here I'm illustrating uh, the full uh, inference of predict prediction procedure of MB2. So uh, for a set of OUs that are going to execute based on the worker forecasting and uh, some candidate self driving action, the OU model will first predict the behavior of each OU as if they run in an isolated environment. And then MB2 would compute the summary statistics of the resource computation among all these uh, concurrent OUs. And next, our, this, is this shared interference model will take the summary statistics as the input and then output the adjustment factors based on the interference impact. So lastly, MB2 just applies uh, these adjustments back to the original OU model predictions and then sums everything up as the inference result. Uh, so finally, let's come back to the uh, end, end experiment that I mentioned earlier. Let's see uh, how good MB2's uh, predictive power is. So in this case, we simulate a, a daily transactional and analytical workload cycle where we just alternate the workload patterns between TBCC and TBCH. So in this case, we shorten the entire uh, workload duration to two minutes to accelerate our evalu evaluation. But in actuality, of course, uh, the, the database workload patterns are much longer, have much longer duration than that. And then in this experiment, we also assume a perfect workload forecasting uh, per uh, 10 seconds forecasting interval. This is because we want to isolate the prediction error of MB2 versus the uh, forecasting error. And lastly, uh, since we don't really have a planning component yet, we use an Oracle planner to change a knob for TBCH and also build an index uh, for TBCC as the self-driving actions. And in this case, we just want to see uh, how MB2's uh, prediction are in terms of estimating the cost and benefit of the actions, but, but not picking the action yet. So now here are the results. So in this case, we first start the TBCC workload and then followed by the TBCH workload. And then we can see that during this stage, the query latency for both workloads are relatively high because they have a suboptimal configuration. Then the Oracle planner 
decides to uh, change the execution law for TBCH to improve the TBCH correlatancy. And we can see that MB2 uh, accurately predicts such improvement. And later on, uh, this oracle builds an index for TBCC with eight threads. And again, MB2 successfully predicts that the correlatancy becomes worse while the index is being built, but also becomes much better uh, after the index creation finishes. And not only that, uh, this decomposed framework also provides detailed insights with the predictions, such as how long this action will take, how much resources that action will need, and as well as uh, which queries are improved or impacted uh, by the action. So believe, uh, we believe that uh, all this information is the foundation for a self-driving database to choose appropriate actions automatically. Uh, so now I already uh, introduced uh, the first two components of our self-driving architecture. Uh, lastly, I'm just going to uh, briefly touch upon the last uh, action planning component for self-driving databases that we are actively working on uh, these days. So for now, uh, we just call this uh, action planning component the pilot of the database. And the goal of this pilot is to choose the best self-driving actions uh, with a forecasted workload as well as the behavior model estimations as the input. So uh, users of the self-driving database would actually need to specify the self-driving objective. For example, this can be uh, minimizing the average query latency or the 99 percentile query latency. So this is essentially similar to a self-driving car that you need to tell the car where you want to go, right? The, the car doesn't know where you want to go. Uh, similarly, users of the self-driving database would tell the database what their organization objective is. And then for this pilot, there are also three additional responsibilities, I think. So the first is that the pilot would need to optimize for both the current and the future workload, and especially under system constraints, uh, such as the memory uh, system uh, memory consumption, max maximum memory consumption. And second is that the pilot would need to decide when to apply these actions and also apply them automatically. And lastly, uh, the pilot should also provide explanations for the past and the future planned actions for debugging or auditing purposes. So uh, to achieve this, we plan to leverage a framework from a control theory called a receding horizon control to build such pilot. So under this framework, the pilot would divide the forecasted workload into a few time intervals and then at the beginning of each interval, the pilot only plans actions for a fixed amount of future intervals, uh, which is called the planning horizon under this framework. And then during this uh, planning horizon, the pilot plans one action for each interval, uh, leveraging the behavior model predictions. Okay. But then after that, the pilot only applies the first action for the first interval and discards, discards all the rest actions. So as the time advances at the beginning of the next time interval, the pilot would repeat this uh, process again. So uh, this receding horizon uh, planning uh, framework gives the pilot the ability to optimize for the immediate workloads while taking into account of future workloads. And uh, these, these intervals also tells the pilot what's the plan of apply which actions at which time point. And this framework is also friendly to incorporate constraints, but I will skip the details. I just want to mention that uh, one challenge of this framework is that it would need to solve a pretty complex mixed continuous and discrete and constrained optimization problem still. So it is still a very expensive uh, process to finish this uh, planning uh, procedure. So for this, we plan to leverage another uh, planning uh, technique with many recent success, such as in, in the AlphaGo AI called multicolor tree search. So essentially what, what this uh, method does is that instead of enumerating the entire exponential search space, this technique would just exercise a few series of randomized actions until some planning budget is exhausted, and then just to pick the best series of actions so far. And of course, you want to be a little bit intelligent about this uh, process so that you can bias the search towards more promising actions. It's not pure random. But anyway, this gives you a trade-off between the action quality and the planning budget. And then you can have the option to control how much the planning budget you give, you give to the system. And we are actively working on this component and, and hope to discuss more about this uh, next time.
So uh, lastly, just want to mention that uh, how to mention about how we are integrating all of these uh, self-driving components into our noise pitch system. So uh, there are two sides of this architecture. So on the left hand side, there's the C++ side I illustrated inside the core DBMS. And then there's also a, there's also a Python side uh, that holds all the models. So inside the C++ side, uh, there's the pilot uh, and then a model server manager that can communicate with the Python side uh, using 0MQ, which is a, a fast messaging library. And then on the Python side, first there's the forecasting model uh, that are trained online with QueryBot 5000. And then as well as there's also the, there are also the behavior models that are trained offline with ModelBot 2. So uh, when the self-driving database executes, it will first send the workload trace to the forecasting models to get the workload forecast back. And then the pilot would search for candidate actions that may improve the forecasted workload. So while it is doing that, it sends the inference request to the behavior models to get the cost and benefit estimation uh, for different self-driving actions. And finally, uh, using all this information, the pilot lastly decide uh, the best action to apply. And I, want, I also want to note that the forecasted workload as well as the planned actions are also stored inside the database system as tables so that we can directly examine them uh, through CQ. Uh, at last, I just want to mention that uh, Noise Page is an open source system. So if you are interested, I could, should, could check it out on this uh, web page and also uh, may even join our journey. And that's all I have today. Thanks for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions if you may have. Okay, awesome, Lynn. Uh, I will applaud on behalf of everyone else. Uh, so we have time for uh, a few questions. So feel free to unmute yourself and uh, fire away. Bertold, go for it. Yeah, so um, I'm not too familiar with the receding horizon control, uh, but uh, uh, database tuning, it's typically like a control problem, right? And uh, reinforcement learning has been created for that purpose. And it has a lot of good Papers have been published, et cetera, et cetera. Can you compare it uh, to deep re like a deep reinforcement learning approach, what you have done here with the uh, receding horizon control? Yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah. Thanks for the great question, uh, Bethel. So we, I don't have empirical results to compare with, right? Because essentially that's a very different methodology and there's lots of lots of work you have to do to, uh, to build an end-to-end re deep reinforcement learning system for the database system for, to achieve uh, self-driving, right? So we don't have empirical comparison against that kind of uh, methodology. But at high level, we actually have quite some uh, internal discussions about reinforcement learning in the early stage of the project. We actually uh, spend quite some time investigating uh, related topics and then thinking about whether we should do that. At high level, there are a few concerns, uh, which is typically reinforcement learning techniques uh, would require uh, lots of uh, training data. And, uh, and also uh, reinforcement learning techniques may be difficult uh, to generate explanations, right? Explainability, unlike, unlike this, receiving horizon control is very easy to understand, right? Every interval is one action. And lastly, uh, there's also uh, the, I mean, based on my understanding of the machine learning literature, reinforcement, reinforcement learning approach are typically not great at data efficiency either. Right. So, uh, especially considering the database system, uh, the, the actions are pretty, some actions may be very expensive, and also there, are, there can be lots of different actions. Right? Essentially, the feature space is very, very large. So, uh, yeah, the, the data efficiency, uh, the complexity to get labels for reinforcement learning, as well as the explainability, and, and, and lastly, the adaptivity part, right? How do you handle, how do you change the learning framework when you update the software, all those concerns make us feel like uh, for the immediate future, uh, this kind, our kind of like a modularized approach may be more plausible. But I mean, as the reinforcement interpreting technique improves, uh, maybe they are becoming more and more predictive. That's also possible. This is just a methodology that we choose. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and anybody else? So then I'll ask you sort of a broad question. What's the, I mean, you've been working on this for several, several years now. What's been the sort of most surprising challenge that you've had to overcome in building the, like the self driving architecture for this system? What's the one thing that you didn't think was gonna be a big problem that turned out to be a bigger problem than we originally thought? Yeah, 
So could you repeat the last sentence? I, 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 I thought the first part, but I did not hear the last sentence clearly. Like what is, what is something that, as you were, you were, you're building this self-driving architecture that surprised you in being a difficult problem that you didn't originally anticipate? Ah, interesting. <laughs> I would say, uh, yeah, thanks for the question. I would say I would say maybe that's the uh, for a many database operations the uh, the intrinsic uncertainty of those um, operations may be the challenge that I encounter. I think that's probably the the biggest when building the self driving database. So what I mean by this is that uh, for certain actions, right? For example, building an index, uh, that's probably easier, and then uh, you would uh, you would especially you know, in-memory setting, uh, it's not that difficult to predict uh, how much time it will spend. But then there are certain aspects of the system, for example, the concurrency control, right? In order to know, in order to uh, really, really fine tune certain aspects of the concurrency control, for example, then it's not that easy to actually estimate the impact of uh, I mean, certain change, right? For example, how the transaction abort rate would actually change I mean, if you change the concurrency control knob. Right, so just in, just 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 uh, this kind of intrinsic uncertainty uh, involved in certain database uh, uh, operations that I think that's probably pretty challenging. Yeah, and also to ask you a, a question, but an uh, easy question: Are self-driving databases ready for prime time? And if not, when when do you think they will be? Sorry, I don't understand the phrase. What do you mean by ready for Sorry. prime time? When, are self-driving self databases ready to be used today? Like, do you think the technology is ready now? Or do you, and if, if not, how, you know, can you roughly predict how long you think it will be, given what you've, you know, what you've seen in your own research and other things? <laughs> yeah, th 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 thanks for the question, but the, the, it's a little bit, uh, I'll say it's, it's a little bit to have a one sentence answer because self-driving database can have different levels, right? So uh, as we have heard, what well, we have discussed, but others may may not know. So uh, yeah, if you are talking about the the ultimate level, in a sense that you know it's like in a scientific novel, right? You 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 don't need to worry about anything ever, and so around that is just always control itself really really well, right? No, there's no need for uh, any human whatsoever. Then that's that's not ready yet. Uh, I think that would be um, would be years to come. Uh, how, how long? I, mean, I, I don't know. Maybe still could be like five years, 10 years. I mean, I, I don't know how long. But then there are intermediate levels that I think are actually achievable. I mean, with this project, I mean, for example, with this, if um, we finish this project, I think for many operations, if you, the, the, or many uh, application scenarios, if the requirement is not very stringent, right? If, for example, if the customer can sometimes uh, tolerate a little bit you know, mistakes made by the system, right? A little bit, sometimes the uh, self-driving database may not choose the best configuration, right? Then uh, if, if the system is good for 90, 95% of the time, the customers can accept that, yeah, then maybe that's, that's possible in the very near future. Right? It depends on the requirement. <laughs> sure, yeah, okay. All right, awesome, so Lane, thank you so much. I will applaud on behalf of everyone else. Thank you for everyone for coming.